Hi everyone. Today I would like to talk about our upcoming neural network model for assigning self-consistent partial charges. So up until now, force fields at OpenFF have largely covered the small molecule space. Chapin just introduced our upcoming protein force field, Rosemary, which will apply to substantially larger molecules. And he's largely focused on generating and refining valence parameters, which can be applied efficiently to molecules through pattern matching by using spokes patterns. So the parameter shown on the screen, for example, applies to the backbone torsion um, outlined in teal. Uh, there is one part of our force field that we can't do this with, our electrostatics terms. So we use AM1BCC as a charge model, which aims to reproduce the electrostatic potential surface around a molecule at HF631G star. Uh, it does this in two steps. Firstly, we calculate molecule charges with AM1, a semi-empirical method, and then we assign bond charge corrections from a library based on the bond types. So this is cheaper than REST, but it still scales pretty poorly with molecular size. As Chapin introduced, the first release of Rosemary will use library charge templates that assign charges by residue. Uh, these templates will get around the two main advantages of m one bcc Firstly, the poor scaling with molecular size. And secondly, the fact that the charges that you get from m one bcc are dependent on the Kofma that you use that you use in the M1 calculation. As Chapin has said, he's averaged charges over multiple confirmations to get a multi conformer representation. So L10 here re uh, refers to the method of selecting multiple conformers, and every time you see it in this presentation, it just needs multi conformer charges. Um, so this was great for normal proteins, uh, but the problem with charge templates is that you're necessarily limited to the scope of what has been templated. And OpenFF eventually wants to address more general problems in the protein and biopolymer world, like post-translational modifications, covalently bound ligands, and other non-standard units. So one of the major projects that we've been working on is developing a neural network model to assign AIM-1 BCC charges to molecules of arbitrary size. This project was started by Simon Boothroyd, um, it builds a lot of, and builds a lot of previous work by Yuan Chin Wang and Josh Holton. And it follows the same general schemes as polymer charge. The general idea is that we use a convolutional neural network to generate continuous atom representations from input features. Uh, we use this to predict the relative electronegativity and hardnesses for each atom. And then from here, we use the same uh, charge equilibration method proposed by Gilson to assign partial charges that, are sum that sum to the total molecular charge. And while neural networks offer a lot of flexibility and we could be trained to anything really, our initial goal is to fit a model to assign AM1 BCC charges that could be used in Rosemary as a drop-in replacement for the tools that we're already using. Uh, and we actually have a couple of these tools that we could choose from. So the OpenFF toolkit has two implementations of AM1 BCC available for users, uh, one using the OpenEye backend and one using the AmbitOS backend. Both of these are generally accepted in the biomolecular simulation community as valid implementations of AM1 BCC. It turns out, though, that these implementations can give different results, and for both parts of the AM1 BCC calculation. So OpenEye and Avatools can give different AM1 charges, and the way that they assign bond charge corrections is also slightly different. So even for a relatively simple molecule like the one on the screen, uh, the charges that you get out from the backends can vary substantially. Right, so back to the project at hand. Our goal is a drop-in replacement for current toolkit backends. Um, and now we have to kind of decide what that means. Because we currently fit our parameters to open eye multi complement charges, um, we can rephrase our goal more specifically to be having a neural network that assigns A1 BCC of 10 charges using open eye as a reference. And uh, the way that we decide that we're close enough is we want our neural network to achieve similar variance to open eye as Abadul's does. So we can use a few different benchmarks to measure if we fit our goal. Firstly, uh, we can compare charges directly to the reference and look at the charge RMSD. We can also use the single highest difference between the charges assigned here. Um, secondly, we can look at more physical, physical comparisons, um, such as the electrostatic surface potential generated by the charges around a molecule um, and for multiple complements. These checks are pretty fast and easy, so they let us iterate quickly through different models. Um, and just go back to this box, to the box plot here, because you will be seeing more of it throughout the uh, presentation. Um, 
This box plot shows uh, how AMBER tools compares to the reference OpenAI charges. And because these are all deviations, lower or more towards the left is better. Um, onto the neural network itself, there are several factors that go into actually creating a neural network, um, such as the actual components of the layers in the neural network, the data that we use to train, and the features that we use as inputs. And I won't go into this first point too much, the actual structure of the model, uh, but basically we did a grid search over various combinations of hyperparameters for different feature sets, and we wound up with this general default model architecture um, showing the best performance. For our training data, we draw from a wide variety of sources, um, like the ones from the top left. We combine them all together, um, and then we filter molecules uh, to within a certain size with a certain number of rotatable bonds. We then pad the data set by generating up to two protomers for each. Um, and then for each of these uh, molecules, we generate conformance and assign open eye charges. After that, we try to generate a diverse but balanced training set that has at least four examples of each atom pair environment uh, by mostly following the, the procedure laid out in uh, Blightsiffer and uh, Serena Ranica's paper. And then we partition it about 80, 20% into training and validation sets. For the test data set, um, it's more straightforward. We just take our existing uh, benchmark industry set and the SPICE data set for machine learning. Um, and then we assign both OpenAI and Amber tools charges. So we wind up with a data set that looks a lot like this uh, with a decent spread over the, over the elements. Um, we also looked at a number of different in input features, but in the interest of time, I won't go into this too much. Um, instead, I'll focus on showing our latest model and answering one key question that we had, which is what should we train our model to actually produce? Because we can get AM1 PCC charges in a few ways. We can fit directly to predict AM1 PCC charges. We could also ask a neural network to predict AM1 charges and then assign our own bond charge corrections on top later. And finally, we can see if adding additional BCCs on top of the AM1 charges already predicted, um, we can see if that gives us better results. So back to the feature set. In general, we found that models have mostly similar performance, past a certain number or minimum number of features. But I'll just focus on model nine here, which um, has the atomic element, um, atom connectivity, uh, whether the atom is in a ring, the total bond order of all the bonds for each atom, whether an atom is aromatic under the AMYBCC model, um, the period of the atom element, and the group of the atom element. So how does it do? Um, firstly, let me explain what's going on in the box plots here. So uh, on the top is, on the top three, uh, we have the neural networks that I introduced previously. Uh, the first one is a neural network trained to produce A1 BCC charges. The second one applies additional bond charge corrections on top of the first one. Um, and the third one is a neural network trained to produce AM1 charges with bond charge corrections by the top. Um, because we generated our own conformance for our reference charges, I also wanted to compare what happens if you just let OpenAI generate conformance for the uh, multiple conformance charges. Um, so that would be the fourth row in the box plots here. And at the very bottom, we have Amber Tools, um, kind of our goalpost. Uh, that and, and this shows the performance of Amber Tools charges compared to the reference charges. Um, so when we compare charges directly to OpenAI, we see that every neural network that we have performs better on average than Amber Tools. But we actually also see um, outliers and extreme values, which could be um, concerning. Uh, and then when we compare between the neural network models ourselves, um, the models trained directly to AMYBCC, uh, the top two, seem to do better than the one uh, trained to produce AM1 charges with BCCs applied afterwards. The story is a bit different if you compare the electrostatic potentials generated by the charges, uh, projected by the charges. So here, on average, our neural networks actually do worse than AMP tools, but they have fewer extreme values. And here we see that the best model is the one that's trained to AM1 charges with bond charge corrections applied afterwards. Uh, that being said, it's not quite clear how concerning these differences are. The difference between the 
the highlighted orange model and amber tools is only 0.14 kilocalories per mole. So we can look at some other physically motivated benchmarks. Another metric is to compare to the QM electrostatic potential. Since m one bcc is fit to the ESP at HS6312 star, uh, we can calculate that same level uh, of, of ESP in, with uh, a QM calculation. Uh, and then just compare the QM property and our general property directly. So this graph plots the root mean squared error to the QM ESP across multiple conformers. Um, and benchmarks with this were performed for the smaller subset of the test set, uh, kind of a selection of the industry benchmark set. So unsurprisingly, uh, the leftmost gray line is breast charges, and they do the best here. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, while the neural networks seem to perform worse than amber tools up until a certain threshold, um, we do see a clear difference where the model trained to produce AM1 charges with BCC supplied later um, perform better than the ones uh, trained directly to AM1 BCC charges. We also compared hydration free energies with different charges in tip 3P water. Um, and we did so for a spread of molecules, so not just ones that had. Um, that were outliers on the benchmarks, but uh, molecules taken over a spread of, of the benchmarks. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, molecules with neural network charges. Um, on the y-axis are molecules simulated with reference open eye charges. In general, they align well, but I will pull a few examples out and have a look at them specifically. Um, the molecule with the highest difference in hydration free energy Unsurprisingly, it scores poorly across all three metrics, especially the ESP. Um, and it's this one here. Uh, that being said, just having a large uh, difference in electrostatic potential doesn't always mean that the hydration free energy um, does, is affected that substantially. Um, the same applies for some of the more concerning RMSE and mass difference uh, uh, benchmarks. Um, where for this molecule, it basically didn't affect the hydration free energy at all. Um, and the inverse also kind of applies. So for example, having very similar um, electrostatic potentials uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you get very similar hydration free energies. So here it's a 0.23 kilocalorie per mole difference in ESP um, compared to a, um, a difference of over two kilocalories in hydration, hydration free energy. Uh, since this network is meant to apply to the biopolymer domain, we also want to have a look at performance on proteins specifically, and especially those with modifications, since that is the primary use case for this network. So I generated a data set of peptides between one and five residues long, with and without post-translational modifications, uh, which are enumerated down here. Um, the results are a bit disappointing. We see generally higher differences from reference charges than on the test set. Um, if you look at just the peptide bond, the RMSC metric is worse, but the maximum difference and the ESP metrics do improve. Um, as to why this might happen, um, we did only have less than 2,000 molecules with a peptide bond in the training set and less than 700 in the validation set. And we actually specifically excluded larger molecules from training and testing. So it might be that we just need more coverage of the protein domain to get better results. Um, we do know that here again, training the neural network to AM1 gives better results than training to AM1 BCC. But overall, it looks like we have um, some work to do to improve. So to some of the stories so far, um, on average, our neural networks perform better than amateur tools on direct charge comparisons, but they do have high outliers. Uh, that being said, in fringe comparisons, we saw that high differences on benchmarks don't always correspond to large differences in hydration free energies. Um, on the ESP benchmarks, our models perform worse than average, although only up to 0.2 kilocalories per mole. And they also have much lower extreme values. And finally, uh, unfortunately, we have relatively poor performance on proteins. To go back to our earlier question of which model we should focus on, using a neural network trained to produce AM1 charges, and applying BCCs on top afterwards seems to be the way to go, especially if you look at physical benchmarks. 
Um, but we have a couple of things going on to keep improving and assessing um, all three of our models. So firstly, we're returning with more peptide data. Um, we also want to generate more QM peptide data sets for ESP comparisons. So far, all the models we I've shown here were fit to charge us directly, but we do want to explore fitting to other properties, such as the electrostatic potential um, and incorporating multiple objectives into training. This has been slow to get started because of some issues with memory, but is now running. Um, with assessing the performance of our models, the proof is really in the pudding. Uh, so we also want to set up some more simulation benchmarks, such, such as protein ligand benchmarks. And finally, we're exploring the possibility of having warning systems for, for possible bad charges. If we can warn users when the predicted output might be inaccurate, they can choose whether to fall back to a conventional way of assigning charges. Um, we found that uh, one way we could do that is that we found it's useful to combine the predictions of multiple neural network models. So the average of neural network models don't necessarily perform better than a single model, but the standard deviation between them can be indicative of um, how much the charge RMSC can vary. So something like this could function as a potential warning flag for users. And um, finally, we would like to make the model more efficient. Right now, very little effort has been made towards that. Um, and it's actually substantially slower than using protein lab retarders. Uh, although overall it is much, much more efficient than using OpenEye or Avatars. So the plan is to release a force field with neural network charges as Rosemary 3.1. Uh, given the results so far, we're confident that we will soon be able to do so after the initial release of Rosemary with library charges. Um, and we're looking forward to the expanded workflows that it will enable. So with that, let me just thank everyone at or involved in OpenFF, especially Gwen Ching, Simon, Josh, and Chapin. And just a reminder that we do have a prototype model available in the OpenFF toolkit now, if you would like to just play with how it works. And thank you very much for listening.